All right, and we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed It. I know my voice is a little still under the weather, but hey, we got a great show for you guys. We're going to talk about espionage between the United States and Russia. This is going to be a good one, guys. Let's get into it, man. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay, guys? HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking. No one else has these documents, by the way. Here's what Fed It covers. Dr. Lafredo confirmed lacerations due to stepping on glass. Murder investigation. You see him reaching in his jacket. You don't know. And he's positioning. Been on February 13, 2019. You're facing two counts of premeditated murder. Racketeering and Rico conspiracy. Young, young slime life here and after referred to as YSL. The defendants is, uh, was 6 9 And then this is Billy Seiko right here. Now, when they first started, guys, 6 9 ran. I'm a fed. I'm watching this music video. You know, I'm bobbing my head like, hey, this shit lit. But at the same time, I'm pausing. Oh, wait, who this? Right? Oh, who's that in the back? Firearms and violent crimes. AKA Pusha I see violated. In order to stay away from the victim. Trapper Pusha I see arrested after shooting at King of Diamonds, Miami Strip Club, injured one this person. Is the, this is the one that, that's going to fuck him up because this gun is not traceable. Well, it happened at the gun range. Here's your boy 42 Doug right here on the left. Okay. Sex trafficking and sex crimes. They can effectively link him to paying an underage girl. I'm going to love my fifth amendment. And well, the first bomb went off right here. Suspect to set down a backpack at the site of the second explosion. Inspired by Al Qaeda. Two terrorists, the brothers, the Zokar Sarnev and Tamer Lin Sarnev. When the cartel shipped drugs into the country. As this guy got arrested for um, espionage, okay? Trading secrets with the Russians for monetary compensation. The largest corrupt police bust in New Orleans history. The days of the police are gone. So he was in this bad boy. We're going to go over his past, the gang ties, so that this all makes sense. All right, we're back. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed It, man. So uh, sorry again for being under the weather. As you guys know, we had our one million subscriber party. It was lit. I drank too much vodka, and it was not good. But uh, that's probably the first time that I got lit. And damn. Uh, woo, I haven't been like that since 2021, February, my birthday. So yeah, it was, it was wild guys. So uh, it was a good time. A lot of people showed out. It was a boat party. We had a bunch of YouTubers in the house, man. Shout out to everybody that came through. Love all you guys. But I guess in the spirit of vodka, we're going to go ahead and get right into today's episode. We're going to be covering Harold James Nicholson, guys, the highest ranking CIA officer that was arrested for espionage. So for this to all make sense, you guys got to understand the cold war. So let's get right into this thing. All right. The Cold War, guys, is a term commonly used to refer to a period of geopolitical tension between the United States and the Soviet Union and the respective allies. <clears throat> and the respective allies, the Western Bloc and the Eastern Bloc. The cold the term Cold War is used because there was no large scale fighting directly between the two superpowers, but they each supported opposing sides in major regional conflicts known as proxy wars. The conflict was based around the ideological and geopolitical struggle for global influence by these two superpowers following the temporary alliance and victory against Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan in 1945. Aside from nuclear arsenal development and conventional military deployment, the struggle <clears throat> for dominance was expressed via direct means such as psychological warfare, propaganda campaigns, espionage, far-reaching embargoes, rivalry of sports events, and technological competitions such as the space race. And what we're going to focus on today is this right here, guys, espionage, all right? So what is espionage exactly? Uh, Cold War espionage describes intelligence gathering activities during the Cold War between the Western allies, primarily the U.S. and Western Europe, and the Eastern Bloc, primarily the Soviet Union and allied countries of the Warsaw Pact, both relied on a wide array of military and civilian agencies in this pursuit. And as you guys know, there's different agencies that are involved in this fight, but the two big ones are the CIA and the KGB. All right. Now, that brings us to the subject that we're going to be talking about in today's episode, which is this guy, Harold James Nicholson. Okay. Born November 15, 17th, 1950, is a former Central Intelligence Agency officer who was twice convicted of spying for Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service, SVR. Now, CIA, as you guys know, is the United States' primary intelligence agency. Uh, it's known or formally as the agency and historically as the company is a civilian foreign intelligence service of the federal government of the United States officially tasked with gathering, processing and analyzing national security information from around the world, primarily through the use of human intelligence and performing covert actions, a.k.a. waterboarding. And it, <laughs> for you guys that are wondering, uh, I'm sure you guys remember that we had uh, Andrew Bustamante, right, who was a former CIA officer. Really great show. I really want you guys to go check that out. It was a very high IQ conversation we talked about. Uh, 
T- torture tactics. We talked about interrogation. We talked about counterintelligence, espionage. We talked about a bunch of this stuff. So if you guys like that type of stuff, man, go ahead and check it out. Real life James Bond type content. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the CIA guys is the ag- the United States primary intelligence agency. Now we got the SVR, who are the ops, okay? And for better, lack of a better term, the Foreign Intelligence Service of the Russian Federation, okay, I can't pronounce all that, uh, or SVRRF is Russia's external intelligence agency focusing mainly on civilian affairs. The SVRRF succeeded, succeeded the first chief directorate of the KGB in December 1991. The SVR has its headquarters in the Yesenevo district of Moscow. And as you guys know, the KGB was basically the CIA equivalent during the Soviet Union era, okay? And they came down, obviously, in, uh, with the Soviet collapse in the early 1990s, a.k.a. 1991. So, yeah, now that this all makes sense to you guys and you understand what the Cold War is, what espionage is, what the CIA is, and what the SVR, a.k.a. the KGB is, right, formerly known as the, uh, formerly known as the KGB, now this is going to start to make a little bit more sense when we go into this documentary. Basically, guys, there's been a longstanding war between, I mean, hell is going on right now. I mean, you guys look at the war with Ukraine, right? The conflict with Ukraine and Russia, it's basically a proxy war for the United States. We had a pretty good discussion on that as well with Andrew Bostamante on how proxy wars, propaganda, espionage, you know, setting up certain things in different countries to set up certain situations for geopolitical climates to clash and war start. All of this, guys, is what happens with opposing countries. Even though we do have trade with Russia, they're definitely a <clears throat> an adversary when it comes to the intelligence realm, okay? And we've been spying on them, and they've been spying on us for decades, okay, guys? So there's a whole unit in the FBI dedicated to Russian counterintelligence, as well as there's also a unit uh, dedicated to Chinese counterintelligence. And I didn't know this, but we learned it from the interview with uh, Andrew. Uh, the Israelis have a really good intelligence agency as well. So, uh, yeah, Th- guys, go check that interview out. It was, it was awesome. Obviously, after you watch this one, we'll go check that one out. A lot of gems were dropped in that if you like this type of stuff, this espionage, James Bond type stuff. All right? But anyway, without further ado, guys, we're going to go ahead and break down an episode from this show called Declassified, okay? And this show's pretty lit. Um, it's it's modern, right? As you guys know, it's not like older, like the FBI file stuff that I typically react to, which I do, still do enjoy. Um, this stuff is newer. I think it's from like 2020, 2021, and 2022. Um, and yeah, we're going to break down this documentary. It's really good stuff. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and take my ugly mug off the screen with my crappy voice. We're going to play this bad boy. Let's get into it. This is a story about the highest ranking CIA agent ever to be convicted of espionage. But clearly, this is a story about betrayal, betrayal of a man against his country and a betrayal of a father against his son. He would sacrifice his country. He would sacrifice his children for the money, for this lifestyle he wanted. And he's a traitor. I mean, you know, in, in our line of work, it doesn't it doesn't really get much worse than that. Now, you guys are probably wondering, like, traitor, what do you what do you mean by this? Guys, you know, as a former government employee, I could tell you guys I had a top secret clearance, a top, top secret security clearance myself. And you take an oath, man. Like you take an oath that you're going to uphold the Constitution of the United States against foreign, against uh, enemies, both foreign and domestic. And right here, guys, this is what I tell you guys all the time about treachery. This is the highest level of treachery. There's a reason why the def- um, spies get pretty stiff sentences in the United States. And yeah. And, and the reason why it's so bad, guys, it's not just about selling secrets, okay? I know you guys are probably like, well, is it that bad? You're just like telling them about some, I don't know, maybe satellites in the sky or whatever. The reason why it's so bad is nine out of 10 times when you sell secrets to foreign governments or foreign agents of foreign governments, what happens is you're compromising human sources and you're also compromising other operations, other uh, intelligence operatives, whether they work for the CIA, DIA, any other intelligence agency. So- you compromise other Americans, guys. You compromise military um, situations. You compromise strategy. So anytime you compromise this stuff, it's not just about selling secrets. It's about getting people killed, man. So this is why this stuff is taken so seriously. And I know people, you know, distrust the government and everything else like that. And I totally get it as a former government employee. I get it. You know, there's a bunch of BS that the government puts out there. But when it comes to protecting our service members, when it comes to protecting innocent American lives when it comes to protecting, you know, government employees that might not necessarily even be involved in this stuff, right? Most government employees guys don't have a clearance, to be honest with y'all. You know what I mean? They barely have a secret, if that. So 
It's about protecting these people, right? And of protecting the American public from foreign threats. So it is what it is. I, I love my country. You know what I mean? People talk crap about the United States all the time, but hey, man, it is what it is. This is the best country in the world, guys. And it's coming from a guy that had immigrant parents. So they used to remind me all the time how great this country is. So I took that oath personally. It's still to this, due to this day. And uh, yeah, definitely enjoy sharing this type of content with y'all. Why would a good CIA officer become a traitor? I mean, the guy's so arrogant and, and, and psychopathic. It's just unbelievable. He committed espionage on behalf of a hostile country. And he used people like poker chips. I don't know how you do that if you have a conscience. I mean, his family is destroyed by what he did. As a former FBI agent and chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, there's yeah, no skip. doubt in Washington tonight. Skip that intro. That this is an intelligence disaster. Here's ABC's Bob Zelnick. CIA Director James Woolsey faced an audience of congressmen anxious to know why it took nine years to figure out that Aldrich Ames was working for the KGB. By then, it oh boy. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and cover this guy as well, because it. it, it <laughs> so Aldrich Ames, guys. All right is probably this is one of the worst compromises of uh u.s intelligence okay so aldrich hazen rick ames born may 26 1941 is a former cia officer turned kgb double agent who was convicted of espionage in 1994 serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole in the federal correctional uh, institution in Terre Haute, indiana ames was a 31 year cia counterintelligence officer who committed espionage against the u.s by spying for the soviet union and russia ames was known to have compromise more highly classified CIA assets than any other officer until Robert Hansen was arrested seven years later in 2001. As you guys know, I did a whole breakdown on Robert Hansen. Y'all already know this was the FBI agent that was, <clears throat> that was head of the Russian counterintelligence section of the Bureau. And he ended up getting arrested as well for espionage. So we got two, I, two CIA operatives and one FBI agent that you know, committed treason against their country. If you guys want, go go back and check my Fed episode where I break this case down as well. This one was a very interesting one. But uh, yeah, Aldrich Ames, uh, this obviously was, I would say, the stimuli to begin the probe against basically U.S. Um, law enforcement and intelligence officers who have access to compromising information that could put us in a bad spot against an adversary like Russia, who is ca highly capable and have good spies of their own. They have a strong military. And I know a lot of people hate uh, Putin right now, but you know, there's no doubt that Russia is a world superpower, which is why anytime we're compromised by Russia, it's a big deal and they make it a spectacle. So you got the CIA guy, Woosley over here, uh, getting answered, uh, answering questions. Um <laughs> To a bunch of dudes over in Washington, D.C. under oath, and no guy ever wants to be there answering questions like that, that it took nine years to catch this guy. But intelligence investigations, guys, are long-term. They're difficult to do. And, you know, these guys are intelligent. They know what they're doing. They don't want to necessarily get caught, so they cover the tracks. You're going to see <clears throat> that uh, the Nicholsons were no different. Intelligence sources say Ames had told the KGB about as many as 10 Russians who were working for the CIA. And guaranteed all those guys definitely got and the Ames case broke open. That was a watershed event inside CIA where we had a high-ranking case officer working for an extended period of time for the Russians inside the building. For the agency, that triggered a introspective moment on how did this happen? For many years, we didn't believe it was possible. That myth was shattered. I felt a lot of anger because I knew what older james mostly had access to okay now i just want to just so i'm going to give you guys these guys the titles so you kind of understand where they're coming from so this guy ed Caron, assistant special agent in charge fbi retired chief of counter espionage uh cia retired so this guy so guys any type of counter espionage spy type cases etc is always going to be investigated by the fbi the cia does not arrest their own 99 percent of the time and the only time they do guys is when they deal with their office of inspector general, which I'll show you guys that real quick. Okay. And I don't think they do criminal investigations uh, to be honest with y'all, uh, office of inspector in general, CIA, this is who they are. Right. So these guys, right. They do audits, inspections, investigations, right. They do criminal cases as well, 
right? But it's not going to be, um, how do I say this? Oh, hold on, my bad. Sorry, guys. Let me share screen with y'all uh, here. I don't know why it's not sharing. Oh, I know why. Minimize this. Hold on one second. Sorry about that, guys. No, nope, you still don't see it. All right, let me hit stop screen. And now present, share. My bad, dogs. We ready to go now. All right. So this is it right here. CIA, uh, Office of Inspector General. And within the U.S. government, guys, you're always going to have OIGs, right? The Department of Justice has Office of Inspector General. The Department of Homeland Security had OIG, et cetera. These guys do criminal cases uh, internally. OK, now, does the OIG do investigations of their employees? Of course. However, when it comes to espionage and cases that are like higher level like that, where it's like serious felonies, the FBI is going to step in. OK, so um, that typically that, that's what OIG does All right, within the CIA. But as far as this guy goes, uh, Ed Caron, the, um, <clears throat> the FBI and the CIA, the, the CIA doesn't do, uh, do criminal investigations, right? You got the Office of Inspector General, which is another agency above, right, the CIA. But as far as like criminal investigations being done like at a high level, it's almost always going to be the FBI when it comes to espionage, terrorism, counterintelligence, et cetera, because that is one of their mandates. That's one of their top three programmatic areas, actually. Uh, terrorism is number one, right, as you guys know, and then counter espionage, and then uh, and then third is political corruption. Those are the three main programmatic areas for the FBI, and this is at least uh, back since 2020 when I was an agent myself for Homeland Security because I have a, a good friend of mine that's actually an FBI agent, really good dude. Uh, we worked together on some organized crime stuff with uh, Latin Kings. But last I remember, those are the three types of investigations they focus on the most. So if there's going to be a spy, a terrorist attack, or, or public uh, uh, public corruption, you know, we're talking about dirty mayors or whatever it may be, the FBI is going to be all over it. I know there were eight to 10 agents that were executed. Oh, and this guy's an assistant special agent in charge. My bad. I forgot to mention this. So this guy, guys, is probably a third level supervisor, essentially. So you got special agent, right? Rank number one. Then above him, you got something called the SSA, a supervisory special agent. Then above him, you got something called an assistant special agent in charge. So the agent, they run the cases. They do their own investigations. They're out there talking to informants, willing and dealing, right? Reports, presenting cases of prosecution. The supervisor is the first line supervisor. He's signing off on reports. He's pushing paperwork up to management so they can get signed, they can get funding, et cetera. He typically manages somewhere between five to 10 agents in a group, or the FBI calls it a squad. Homeland Security, we used to call it groups, but it's the same thing, basically, right? Then on top of that first line supervisor, aka an SSA, you got the assistant special agent in charge. Now he manages three to five different groups. So he's overseeing five to 10 supervisors who then in turn supervise five to 10 agents. Okay. So this guy was pretty high ranking within the bureau to be uh, an a what we call an ASAC assistant special agent in charge. And then on top of him, some agencies, I know Homeland Security that has this, you have a uh, deputy special agent in charge, AKA known as a DSAC pause. And then over him is the SAC, right? The FBA calls it SACs. We call them SACs uh, in Homeland Security, which is the special agent in charge. And he's in charge of like an entire region, okay? Like a major city, there'll be a SAC that sits in, you know, Miami, then another SAC in New York, et cetera. If it's really big, they'll have more than one SAC. Like New York City field office for FBI, they got multiple special agents in charge, right? Which that guy is easily overseeing 100 plus agents, all right? So that's typically how it goes, guys. That's kind of the breakdown of uh, both, both not just the FBI, but other agencies have a very similar structure. Homeland Security, we had an identical structure essentially to the FBI. Uh, DEA is very similar, ATF, et cetera. The only difference is that um, since the FBI is the la largest criminal investigative, criminal investigative agency in the United States, they're a bit bigger. So they have more, I guess, ranks and agents, but the general structure is typically the same. And then the second largest agency is actually my former agency, Homeland Security Investigations. So we have a similar structure to them as well. So, all right, let's get back into it here. Sorry, my voice is crappy, guys. Hopefully I'll be back to normal tomorrow. <laughs> as a result of information, one of those was one I was directly involved with. There was a great deal of anger in the Senate intelligence community. Anger at who? CIA. They wanted to find them themselves over a long period of time before they brought it to the FBI. But finally, when they did turn it over to us, he had already done most of the damage. The Ames case is perhaps. And the reality is they can't do it themselves. Like they probably wanted to identify him themselves because it's kind of embarrassing to have another agency come in and arrest your guy. But 
the CIA can't arrest their own. They're not a criminal investigative agency. And we talked about this in detail with Andrew as well. I want y'all to go back and watch that interview, guys, because we kind of talk about the differences between law enforcement and intelligence. The CIA can't arrest their own. If anything, the most they could do is what I showed y'all with the Office of Inspector General. But something like this, espionage, working with a foreign government, et cetera, this is beyond the capabilities of the Office of Inspector General. They're typically coming in like, oh, you lied on this application. Oh, you did this. You beat your wife. Like some BS typically is when Office of Inspector General comes in. When the Bureau comes in, or uh, typically it's going to be uh, more serious, okay? And again, you guys got to remember, what did I tell y'all before? You got terrorism, counterintelligence, right? And then the third programmatic area is public corruption. As a CIA officer, you are considered a public official, which falls under what? Political corruption. So of course, the FBI is going to be all over this because not only is it counterintelligence, but it's also uh, public corruption as well. The most graphic and vivid example of the need to make structural changes in the operation of our intelligence uh, community. When Alder James was arrested, we knew he did significant damage to the intelligence community. In addition to that, we had other cases that Alder James was not involved in that went bad. You assume at that point that somebody else is trying to steal secret information and give it to the Russians. And this is not a one-off event, and we've got to make sure that if there's any more, we have to find them. As soon as Ames was brought to justice, I ordered a comprehensive re-examination and both internal and external studies of our counterintelligence operations. When the president is over here talking about it, then you know it's a big deal, man. Bumbukat! Then y'all know it's a big deal. Because you guys got to remember, the president gets an intelligence briefing every day from all the intelligence communities. So when something like this happens, it comes across his desk. It directly affects his ability to preside over the country. One more time for that. Okay? Like, this is the issue whenever I really want y'all to understand the gravity of this. When you're the president of the United States, right, you're getting an intelligence briefing almost every day from all the intelligence agencies, CIA, NSA, DIA, all the different, and there's like 31 intelligence agencies in the United States, okay, all working it for, in different parts, right? Some do satellites, some do human information, blah, 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 right? As the president, you're making geopolitical decisions every single day that may affect, that's obviously going to affect the United States and relations with other countries. So when you know that you've been compromised, guess what happens? Your negotiating power, your ability to have leverage goes out the window. And Russia is one of the worst countries to not have leverage against when you're making, you know, very uh, delicate decisions uh, with a country that is considered a hostile, a hostile, right? We have to be nice and polite with them in person. Ha ha ha. You know, I'm sure you guys have seen Obama laughing with Putin on many occasions, et cetera. But the reality is they both, they both hate each other. So when something like this happens, guys, the, the Audrey Ames case, what happened was it compromised Bill Clinton's ability to have power and leverage over Russia, which directly affects his ability to make decisions. And it has longstanding ramifications for any type of decision he makes in that part of the world because Russia has a lot of allies. So he might not necessarily be able to do things that he wanted to do before because intelligence is compromised. Okay. So, um, and this has been going on between the United States and Russia for years, guys. We catch one of their spies, they catch one of ours. We do a trade, all said and done. That's why the Brittany Griner trade was such a bad move because you basically had, we had, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Oh my God, I forgot his name. This is L for me. I'm going to give myself a stupid. I'm going to pull his name, but basically the Lord of War or the Merchant of Death, right? Um, we had him and we could have traded him for a spy, but we didn't because we're dumb and we decided to be politically correct and get a WNBA player. Um, hold on, Merchant of Death. I already know y'all are probably frying me in the chat. Sorry, guys, I haven't really slept in a long day. Uh, Victor Bout. Oh my God. Uh, sorry, guys. But yeah, so. When you have someone like that that you can trade and you go and get a WNBA player, that's why it was such a big fucking L. You know what I mean? Like, and me coming as a former law enforcement guy that knows the background between Russia and United States and how we've been playing this dance with them for the better part of damn near 50, 60 years. Um, anytime you have one of theirs, you're supposed to trade to get one of your own back. And we ended up not doing that. We didn't get that Marine home, which is, you know, absolutely stupid. But hell, that's the Biden administration. Uh, but let's get back into it. But I just wanted to let you all know the gravity of when these things break, what happens? The president is talking about it, guys. As a result, a presidential decision directive was issued that basically said 
take a person with uh, experience and seniority, send him over to the CIA. He's still FBI, but he'll. There you go. Bam. So the chief of CIA's counterintelligence center, uh, counterespionage group will be permanently staffed by a senior executive from the FBI. Holy. <laughs> and the reason for that, guys, right, they're trying to be polite is because the CIA doesn't have law enforcement capabilities. So they're going to put a liaison from the FBI to kind of oversee them and make sure if any of y'all do anything stupid when it comes to counterintelligence, we're going to open a case on y'all immediately and get this thing going. Because remember, Ames had been selling secrets for nine years. Imagine how much classified info he gave to his Russian handlers over at the KGB that they were able to directly move back to Moscow, which would direct, which would hurt, right? Our political leaders' ability to make decisions for the betterment of the United States. So guys, espionage has long-standing effects which directly impact the country's national security. I know you guys say, oh, bot, maybe, blah, 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 or yo, the guy don't trust the government, whatever. I understand that. You have a total right to distrust the government. But when you got people working for the government, selling secrets to hostile enemies like Russia and China, this is a big deal, guys. This is a very big deal. Run their counter espionage group that's responsible for uncovering spies. I got a call when I was in Los Angeles. We want you to come back and run this group. When I went over to the uh, counter espionage group, I asked him if I could bring an assistant with me, somebody from the FBI. And John, I had worked with previously in Los Angeles. This opportunity to be the first FBI agents really inserted in almost light cover within the CIA was what I call a singular opportunity. And I tend to value. So as you guys can see, so you had the assistant special agent in charge overseeing this group, and now you have a supervisory special agent underneath him, all right? those more so they're putting they're not just putting regular agents over there they're putting higher levels of of bureau agents over there at the cia which tells you guys the seriousness of this of how they're really trying to combat any moles in the cia after the Ames arrest which sets the stage for this case that we're going to cover today i said to ed i'll come and i've never regretted it most of the people in the cia did not know i was there looking for a spot do you have a CIA badge or an FBI? CIA badge. So they didn't know you were from the FBI. Within the first week, everybody in that building knew I was from the FBI. Yeah, of course. <laughs> nice job, my friend. Nice try. But, you know, people in the government talk, you're over there with the CIA. The CIA hires some very bright people. So, of course, they're going to know that you're a bureau guy from the way that you speak, the way that you operate, the way that you convey yourself. It's very obvious uh, when you meet a law enforcement guy, let alone an FBI agent. I'll tell you guys this. Put me in front of an FBI agent, I'll be able to tell you right away if he's a bureau agent. They have certain mannerisms. They have certain ways of speaking that it's just very obvious, okay? It's, it's just, you'd have to be in front of one and I could point them out immediately. But yeah, bureau agents, they all speak, look, behave the same, have a very similar look. Uh, yeah. But I'm not surprised that the CIA knew who that he was a FBI guy immediately. It's hilarious because intelligence, like I told y'all before, is much different than law enforcement. We think differently. We think very differently. They didn't particularly care for me being there, but they definitely knew who I was. Inside the CIA headquarters building, people were whining and bitching about all kinds of things and the FBI, this and that. The FBI has a job to do, just like we do. We clearly had a serious problem. And th there's been a rift between the FBI and the CIA for a very long time, guys. And the reason for that is because they're both technically, they're both intelligence agencies. The only difference is that the FBI is a law enforcement agency as well as an intelligence agency. CIA handles intelligence abroad, overseas, while the FBI handles intelligence domestically. And the CIA is supposed to refer anything to the FBI that touches domestic and or might have some type of terrorism nexus that law enforcement could thwart right away. And the FBI is the lead on that. That is why they've always had these longest standing issues. And if you guys watch our 9-11 breakdown, the CIA, excuse me, the FBI blamed the CIA for not giving them information ahead of time that, uh, that where they had identified hijackers that were actually in the United States. So this has been a longstanding issue between agencies, which is kind of funny for me as a former Homeland guy, because I'm not in the middle of this BS. I told y'all before, classified stuff is useless. <laughs> now, when I get over there, I get all my briefings and I learned that I had over 300 cases in the CIA where CIA employees had failed to 
it's counterintelligence polygraph. That means is that you had 300 potential spies in the CIA that had never been resolved. At the time, if you fail a CIA polygraph, nothing ever happens to you. Alder James had failed the polygraph several times, and nothing was done. When I came in, I put a stop to that. Now, we know that polygraphs are typically BS guys, but they do help indicate deception when lies are being told. And for some of you guys that are wondering, this is also known as a lie detector test. It doesn't necessarily detect if you're lying. It detects bodily functions, changes, and fluctuations when being asked questions. And what they do is they give you base questions. Hey, what's your name? Where are you from? They get a baseline of how you, what your bodily functions are like, right? Or your demeanor when you tell the truth. Then they start pressing you about questions that... <clears throat> That might get you to lie, and then they see how your body reacts to those, and then that's when they, you know, make a, and I'm saying this with air quotes here, uh, determination that you might be displaying deceptive uh, trait, uh, deceptive uh, practices or behaviors, right? And then they can go ahead and fail you or give you inconclusive or whatever. But the point I'm trying to make is that it's extremely subjective based on the polygrapher. And there's been many people that beat polygraph tests. It's, it's just another tool in the toolkit for them to uh, kind of know where to pry and ask questions. I had my own polygraph examiner. We all did our own test and we brought the individual in and basically said, you're either going to resolve this or you're not going anywhere. We had to resolve it one by one. You must have been quite a lot. And just so you guys know, for a polygraph, you get a polygraph every five years when you have a top secret clearance. It's called your re-up. So um, what he means by all these, all these guys got failed their polygraphs, he doesn't mean their initial polygraph to get the job. They mean during the course of their career, you've been in a, you know, a CIA operator. Let's say you've been in CIA for 20 years. You're going to probably go through four to five different polygraphs, maybe even more depending on your security clearance, right? If you have a SCI, you might do it damn near every three years. So, uh, so that's why, what he means when he says, oh, we have to do their, uh, their, Retail their polygraphs because a lot of people might get confused like wait how did they get the job if they fail the first time no they pass the first one to get the job after they get the job they have to keep going through re-ups and it's very difficult to fire a government employee so a lot of times i can see why uh uh cia, CIA people and or government people might not necessarily lose their job for failing a polygraph or getting an inconclusive but this guy came in and put an end to that very unpopular you had this pool of unresolved polygraphs, so you want to push and get those resolved as quickly as possible. When you start from 300, it takes a long time to get down to half a dozen. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the reasons why people were having trouble with the polygraph wasn't because they were a spy, is that they'd been playing loose with the rules when they're out there in the field. But it's not espionage. Are you a spy? That's all I'm interested in. I'm not care if you didn't pay your income tax. In 98% of the cases we were able to resolve, they had nothing to do with espionage. But then in the summer of 1996, out of the herd, one individual particularly emerges. That was James Harold Nicholson. But here we go. And that's how they figured him out. And here we go. And that's how they figured him out because uh, poly failed polygraphs. Nicholson had failed the polygraph Plus, he was assigned to various areas where cases went bad. So he was a suspect, a strong suspect at that time. Jim Nicholson was an instructor at the CIA's training facility, the farm. He was one of the instructors to train spies. So he knew the identity of every agent that we were going to send overseas. And he could. Oh, man. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh. Provided this information to the Russians. And that's what concerned us the most. When you expose a spy who's working in a hostile country that is not allied with us, for them, that's a death sentence. You're accused, you're tortured, and you're murdered. His career, his experience is just devastating. Even worse than AIMS. I can't believe the potential damage he could have done. We had cases that Alder James was not involved in that went bad. You assume at that point that somebody else was trying to steal secret information and give it to the Russians. This is not a one-off event. If there's any more, we have to find them. In the summer of 1996, yeah. So you got a guy with a bad, with, you know, a bad poly, and you find out that Aldrich, Aldrich Ames, right? You know all the information he gave over, and some of the things that they were compromised in wasn't necessarily... Ames' information. So you can only imagine, right, Yay! what's going through their minds. Like, do we have another spy? And remember, guys, this is the early 90s. This is before Robert Hansen. This is before any 
big CIA operatives have been arrested prior to Ames. So for them, this is all new. And they're like, yo, dude, we got to catch this other guy immediately because this information that's being compromised didn't come from Ames. We know what he gave already. So you can only imagine uh, the craziness in their head. Because the longer you wait, the more American lives that can be lost. FBI team had already whittled down their cast of possible candidates. And one of those was Jim Nicholson. Jim Nicholson was working as a single dad and had custody of his three children. For Jim, I think the divorce clearly precipitated some financial strains that weren't there before. Now being a single father, having to pay alimony, all those sort of pressures were coming to bear together with his expensive tastes, you know, tailored suits as opposed to off the rack. His lifestyle demanded more money than you could make as a case officer. And it looked like he might be interested in making more money. It's one thing to go after a spy who, who may have only had one course in counterintelligence. It's another thing to know you're going up with the senior varsity. He was an extremely well-trained spy with a great deal of previous experience. We all knew that if we make one mistake with this guy, he's gone. So with that information in hand, certain opportunities came up. Uh, one of them was Jim's announced vacation to Singapore. So the discussion then came. And you guys are probably wondering, what's the CIA's um, case officer salary? It's right around 100 grand a year, guys, um, which back then, 100 grand in 1995 is the equivalent. It is the equivalent of purchasing power to about 200K today. So, hey, he was doing all right. Yeah, 100,000. Oh, excuse me. Oh, my bad. Let me, here, I'll find a number for y'all in a second. My bad. Let me, I'll get it to y'all. Came down with Director of Central Intelligence, George Tenet. Do we let him go? Don't we let him go? Decision was made by George Tenet that we would inform the Singapore Intelligence Service. And Jim Nicholson would go to Singapore. When he got off the plane in Singapore, he's under surveillance. And he almost immediately begins what we call dry cleaning. Surveillance detection runs designed to pick up anybody trying to surveil or follow you. That's where and they learned this from obviously their own school. And we call them a heat run, but same thing. The term dry cleaning comes from you're stripping or cleansing yourself of any of these unwanted attachments. Going down a set of stairs and then immediately turning around and going back up. So if anyone's following you, you're likely to run right into them. Looking in the pane glass windows of large department stores, he's not looking at what's behind the glass, he's looking at the reflections in the glass. But going around town dry cleaning, doing surveillance detection runs is not what one usually does on a vacation. All right, guys. So it's it's roughly somewhere between forty and fifty thousand dollars back then in the mid nineties, a hundred thousand dollars of today. But you're still only suspecting him because you don't have that last link. You haven't made your case yet. But on the third day of surveillance. The proverbial black limo pulls up to the curb, the door opens up, and Jim hops in. Our surveillance team looks down to the license plate, Russian embassy. Holy! Once he went in that embassy, he was a bad guy. There was no suspect anymore. He is the subject of an espionage investigation. Now you focus all your attention on building a case against him. So now, I know you guys are probably wondering, well, yo, Myron, hold on. He just went into a Russian embassy. How's that against the law? The reason why it's against the law, guys, is because when you have a clearance to the same level as this, this guy with the background that he has, with the position that he has, the title he has, you need to declare anytime you go into a foreign embassy. Okay? So that is why they knew right away that this is probably their guy from an espionage standpoint, and he's not authorized to be there, especially in the embassy of a hostile country like Russia. So after identifying Jim in Singapore as our spy, the next challenge was where do we position him so that he can do the least amount of damage? So after uh, discussion, this is actually a very good tactic that the government employs. Anytime they have someone who they suspect of, uh, the FBI does all the time, of being uh, involved in espionage or selling secrets or whatever, they immediately move him into somewhere where they feel like they're getting a promotion. Hell, they might even get paid more, right? So that doesn't tr trigger any alarms. But they lose a, a significant amount of access, they lose reach, and they're no longer put in a situation where they can continue uh, to compromise intelligence. Now, of course, being a, a spy, they're going to 
try. But what this does is it allows them to protect the security of the invest investigation while simultaneously putting the suspect in a location where they can't necessarily compromise classified information to the same degree. Of course, they're going to try. But typically at this point, the FBI wants to be there and witness it when they try. See a difference? So that they can gather evidence. The decision was made to put him as a branch chief in the counterterrorism center. Given the environment at the time, you know, this pre 9-11, that would be the place in which we could most effectively contain additional damage that he might do. You don't demote him because then he's wondering well, what's going on here. But you promote him, you're letting him know he can go do what he wants because nobody, nobody's watching me. So it's finally in June 1996 that Jim began. And typically they'll get promoted to like a supervisor, maybe one step higher than they were prior. So they don't get so they still have the illusion in their head that uh, they have access. They're not in trouble, etc. Because the last thing you want to do is trip one of these types of guys off because they'll cover their tracks immediately. Again, his new duties as a branch chief. They did the same thing to Robert Hansen as well when they were investigating him. In counterterrorism. Now you have to collect the evidence and present it for an arrest warrant. We had to monitor his activities when he's outside of Langley 24 hours a day. That means every time he stepped foot outside his house, there had to be a surveillance on him. Anytime he's in his house, we have to know what he's talking about, who he's talking to. And then they had to know everything he's doing. All right, so let me tell you all something real quick about 24-hour surveillance that most people don't know unless you're on the job. 24-hour surveillance, guys, is literally one of the hardest things to coordinate when you're a case agent. And the reason why is because you're watching the guy all day, which means you automatically need three, at least three surveillance teams that are watching the guy for eight to 10 hours at a time. And on top of that, you can't lose sight of him. And I'm sure that they were probably also like bugging his phone and all this other stuff. But uh, 24, 24 seven uh, surveillance is extremely labor intensive. So for them to put him under that type of surveillance, right? Cause remember, he's just living his life. He's not spying all the time, right? He, him spying might account for only maybe two to three minutes of his day guys, but the other 23 hours and 57 minutes, you got to be watching this guy, watch him when he goes on dates, watch him when he does strange activity in his free time, watch him when he's with his kids, when he's going to the gym. It's it can be very labor intensive, guys. Like these 24-7 surveillances is not are not as exciting as you guys think, especially when it's someone like, like this that's smart about how they move. They're not necessarily committing a crime that you can see all over, you know, overtly. And they're typically living a regular life. It's not like a drug dealer where you're seeing a meet with a bunch of other, you know, drug dealers and drug um, addicts, etc. This is a dude that might get a piece of information every now and then and decide, you know what, let me sell this. I could probably make a bag, right? And that transaction might happen in two seconds and you can't miss it. So 24 seven surveillance is extremely difficult. And that's coming from my experience of getting 24 seven surveillance teams on point. Like it's, it's not fun. Then, then agents start complaining, bro, come on. Do we really need 24 seven, blah, blah, blah. You're the case agent. You feel like an asshole. Like, oh man, do we, nah? you know, cause you don't want to make the guys that you work with in your group feel bad or sorry, you don't, you start to feel bad because you don't want them to hate you. So there's a lot of politics that go behind the scenes too when you're the case agent on these types of things doing 24-7 surveillance. We had to get a human source in his office so that we know every time he gets up from his desk, he walks out, our guy goes out with him. We had to get somebody right next to him. 1996, I get a cable in the field that says you're assigned to human resources. It was something. And guys, a cable in the field basically means like a notification of some type of commu of electronic communication, or whatever. That's what the CIA calls it. But that's typically what it is. Some kind of a message. You can just boil it down. It's a message. I didn't want to do. And I clearly thought I'd piss my division chief off. But I processed out of the field job I was in overseas and then came back. I did not want to be in human resources because that's like <laughs> the kiss of death for a case officer. So sit. So and as a case officer, guys, your job is to recruit human sources. You're out there abroad. You're making things happen, et cetera. So for this guy, it's like, damn, I'm in trouble. Why the hell did they send me to HR? But you're going to see what they call them in for. In my brand new desk in HR, one morning, uh, I got a call from the front offices. And the boss up there called up and said, don't tell anybody where you're going. Speak to nobody. Get up here in front of my desk right now. I said, OK. McGuire sat down. Chief explained to him, we want to put you on a very special assignment, but we're not going to tell you what it's about. And you have to give me an answer, yes or no, right now. And if, could you imagine? Boom, Give me an answer right now. Uh, well, I don't know what I'm doing. It doesn't matter. Give me an answer right now. Boom, <laughs>
If it's no, your career is over. I didn't say that, but that, that wasn't implied. There was a long pause where I didn't say anything, and neither did he. The only variable that I had in the room was there was a man in there that I didn't recognize. I said, can I ask one question? He said, you can ask it. I might not answer, but go ahead. I said, who was this man? Who was this? Typical CIA response. <laughs> you can ask, but I might not answer. Okay. I got up. I walked over and introduced myself, shook his hand. And introduced himself as Ed Curran, the highest ranking FBI agent assigned inside CIA. My mind was racing at that point. And he said, and just so y'all know, he, <laughs> you're like, am I in trouble? Because you got to put yourself in his shoes. He's, he came from an international assignment, gets put in human resources, which everyone freaking hates. Then next thing you know, there's some random dude there in a suit that he doesn't know. Who's this motherfucker? Right. And then the guy walks up and says, hey, FBI. He's like, oh, my God, what the hell? What? I do not. Right. <laughs> This is the equivalent of like, you know, being a you being a drug dealer and they kick your house down. FBI, open so up. I can only imagine what was going through his mind. Like, what, what's the FBI guy doing here? You got to give me an answer now. If you say no, go back down to HR. If you say yes, you'll figure out what this is all about. And I just decided if this is a way out of HR, I'm in. I said, fuck <laughs> it. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll do it. Once he accepted the, the uh, assignment, I said, go outside now. Go outside the building. Don't stop. Don't say anything to anybody, and two people will meet you. I said, yes, sir, and I left the building. <laughs> and they took me to a safe house in Northern Virginia. The case agents then briefed me on what the issue was, and they told me, we have a spy inside the building, and we want you to help us catch him. Initially, it was like getting kicked in the stomach. Another major espionage case inside of CIA. It was a devastating piece of information. We had to have someone as close up as possible to Nicholson, and John hopefully was going to be that candidate. But you couldn't thrust John on Jim, or Jim would be suspicious. You had to do it in a way that Jim would think it was his choice, his selection that brought John into the game. The first step was go through the interview process and get him to pick you. And that job was the deputy chief of the unit that was run by Nicholson. The interview wasn't particularly long, but I got along well with him. It was clear he didn't have a lot of good things to say about the structure of the leadership cadre in the agency. My views of HR were a good laugh during the interview, and he understood completely that I thought I was going to die if I stayed there. Whenever you have an interaction with anybody that's a plan. So this is smart. They're making him feel like the target here. Uh, they're making him feel like he has some authority because he's able to actually interview the guy who's acting in an undercover capacity to actually spy on him. So this was a smart move to make that person still feel comfortable and still have like they some, have some type of authority. And activity, you always come back and reflect on what you did. And I came away with the opinion that it went pretty good. Jim did an excellent job as a, as a manager choosing the best person for that job. And ultimately, he chose McGuire. Unbeknownst to Jim, John was a spy, and it was probably the last person he wanted to have next to him. And ended up sitting in the desk in the office right next to. And more than likely, guy, they probably guys. The reason why the FBI selected this guy to be the case officer is because he probably was a go-getter, probably had a good reputation, and knew that if he was the one to be interviewed by the target, he would more than likely get the position. Nicholson's, and then it was game on. Going to McGuire is a big, big risk because now you're going outside your perimeter. This is a person going to be the closest to Nicholson, day in and day out. They're going to go to lunch. They're going to, you know, talk about cases. So that person could do something stupid, and Nicholson, of course, would be alerted to something wrong here. Basically, you have a one-strike scenario. If you mess up or you give away something, you could derail the entire investigation. I was brought in as an undercover guy to work against Jim Nicholson. My job was to catch him doing an espionage act that would directly tie him to the Russians. So in the spring of 1996, I started as Nicholson's deputy in the counterterrorism center. At that time, radical Islamic terrorism was on the rise. So there was a lot of real work stuff going on that you had to focus on. They were looking at uh, critical players who eventually became known 
uh, post 9-11. So it was very critical stuff that they were doing. In the middle of all that, you're trying to catch your boss compiling information that he's going to give to the Russians. To have somebody human source in touch with him every day, it's invaluable. Getting to know him was part of the exercise. I spent a lot of time going to lunch with him, drinking beer with him. My goal with the investigation was to immerse myself in him, but it was mentally draining every day because I describe him as a flawed personality, a flawed man. Over time, that became very apparent that he had a special view of himself a ruthless, narcissistic guy who didn't care about anybody. And you're with him all the time. There was no retreat from him. Jim Nicholson is the most formidable opponent you could possibly go up against as a counter espionage agent because he's so well trained in the, the craft. And McGuire provided personality assessment back to the FBI. What's he thinking? How is he thinking? And John was very, very good at it. And even with John, as close as John was to him, it still wasn't giving us the exact intel and insights as to what is he doing minute by minute, second by second. That's one of the reasons why we eventually knew he had to get a fiber optic camera in his office. You know, you've seen those, those tile ceilings with the thousands of little pinholes in them. It was no bigger than just one of those little pinholes. And this is pretty impressive, guys, because this is the mid-90s when you're getting this type of technology. You know what I mean? or late 90s at this, at this point, possibly. At one point, Nicholson got up on his chair and was rooting around in the ceiling. He was getting up and actually reaching up into the ceiling and pushing tiles. What did you do? John, move your butt. He's lifting tiles. Doesn't take much more than that. John understands the implications. So I just barged into his office, and he was standing on the chair, and I asked <laughs> Nice save. So I said, what the hell are you doing in here? He says, I thought something was loose. I'm, I was just taking a look. I said, oh, okay. He didn't find anything. He didn't disrupt anything. So there was no compromise and everybody breathed a huge sigh of relief. Next thing we needed was to get access to his van that he parks in the parking lot. That was a big thing. He was like a Northern Virginia soccer mom. He had a minivan. But for him, I mean, it fit the mold. He he was playing a role. He didn't want to attract any attention to himself. A single dad driving a minivan with three kids. You know, invisible guy in Northern Virginia. We managed to manipulate him in a way that he would go on a business trip, leave his van at the Langley compound as opposed to park in his driveway. Oh man, the ruses are coming in. Gotcha, bitch! Oh. Then of course we didn't want to get careless or lazy. There are still eyes on the Langley compound. So we did it really, really late at night. We had to pick up that van, physically pick it up, you know, forklift it, because he may have checked the odometer reading on it, pull it into another garage and CIA compound, and the FBI went through the whole van. See all the steps they got to take to make this happen? Man, you're dealing with smart individuals. So, you know, this is, you got to be one step ahead of the guy you're investigating, especially with high-stakes cases like this with espionage. So I applaud the FBI here for taking, like, you know, super, uh, how do I say, careful steps to protect the integrity of the case. Some people say, isn't that a little extreme, putting it on a flatbed so the odometer wouldn't even change? I said, not if you're trained like Jim was trained. Facts. He knows how to detect surveillance. He can put traps in the car. He knows all these techniques. You underestimate him at your own peril is what we felt. They went through that van and they got significant data, intelligence data. He had to left his computer in there, everything. We were able to image that laptop and do it. Bingo. A quick initial assessment as, as to what was on there. And we found a tasking order from his Russian handler. And that's even before we did the really in-depth analysis that we were able to do in an offsite. We discovered that he'd given the true name and identity of the spies who had gone through this. And offsite guys is another office that an agency controls where they, you know, run their investigation, but it's not like the official one. You know, like typically there's going to be like the big office you can Google and you'll be able to find it. And offsite is typically another office utilized by, uh, especially a law enforcement agency, to stage, make things happen, go through evidence, et cetera. So that's what they mean by offsite. 
And then when he says a tasking, that means instruction from his Russian handler on what to do next to continue the facilitation of uh, <clears throat> sharing information, or in this case, sharing American secrets with Russia. CIA training program with him to his Russian handler. That was a line that really frosted me at that point, because that is a mercenary activity that I don't think any other spy has ever done. The question at that point is, do you have enough for arrest and conviction? We didn't have that at that time. I wanted to shoot him at his desk, the truth be told, but I wanted to catch him. And in October, we had the first major break in the case. I had gone off campus and had lunch with Nicholson. And Nicholson was driving erratically, and it looked like he was doing a surveillance detection run. And he said, we're going to a post office. I collect stamps. There's some unusual stamps here. And we went out to the post office. He bought them, and then we proceeded back to the building from there. And for me, looking at it as a case officer, I thought, He's going to mail something overseas. This is actually pretty cool how he did this. This guy was smart, man. Going to the post office, get a special stamp. That would be a, a clue. That would have alerted the FBI right away that something's unusual happening. John gave us the heads up that we needed to watch him like a... But surface level, you would never suspect he's doing anything nefarious just for getting stamps. But since the FBI had this guy there, they're like, oh, well, that's kind of weird. What's going on here? hawk we summoned the resources and we did just that they bet heavy on what i told him they covered him relentlessly and they caught him mailing a postcard to the russians they processed his postcard as evidence and then put the mail back in the box and sent it on its way the postcard indicating his intent to now so let me break this down for you guys real quick how labor intensive that actually is now, me as a Fed watching this, I'm like, you know, to average viewer might be like, oh, wow, okay, so they intercepted the mail. Who cares? No, bro. You got a guy telling you, yo, we're about to do this. He's getting a postcard, et cetera. You're mobilizing units. Remember, guys, there's no cell phones. This is mid-90s. You're mobilizing units, getting out there as quickly as possible, getting eyes on him. You see him put the postcard in. Now, it's not like the FBI has keys to open up the mail, guys. They got to go to a postal inspector. Not only do they got to go to a postal inspector, they got to go to a postal inspector they trust and say, hey, bro, we need you to help us out. Open up this mailbox, right? So, and this is before the days of like the JTTF being huge. So a lot of times there'll be postal inspectors on these task forces, but this is pre-9-11. So they got to contact the guy. Hey, can you open this up for me? Then they have to go through the mail, find the postcard, put everything back like nothing happened, and continue on with the investigation so even though we just saw like maybe 10 20 seconds of a snippet of them opening the following him getting the mailbox open etc me as an agent looking i know what they had to do to actually get that mailbox open so uh it's quite a bit of work man quite a bit of work investigations ain't easy guys especially when you're dealing with espionage these guys cover their tracks well for the most part travel and meet with his russian handler hello old friend I hope it is possible that you will be my guest for a ski holiday this year on 23, 24 November. A bit early, but it would fit my schedule nicely. I am fine and all is well. Hope you are the same and can accept my invitation. Best Coded message, guys. As regards, Neville R. Stracci. Who the heck is Neville R. Stracci? It could be a code name for him. There's a variety of things it could mean. That's a communication between him and the Russians, saying, I'm ready for my next meet. It's a signal that he's doing something. Once we saw the, the contents of that letter, we knew we had to finally bring this thing down. But what really put the nails in that final coffin was prior to his trip, we witnessed Jim on that fiber optic camera photographing classified documents to pass along to his Russian handlers. We knew he- Oh, they- <laughs> Oh, shit! Oh, shit! He was taking pictures of classified documents. He was storing up and getting ready for his trip. It was like cramming for an exam. We knew that if he was leaving the country for a meeting with the Russians, that Nicholson would have to take the compromising material and his intelligence with him. So we were very confident that when he left on this next trip, he would have classified material in his person or his bags in some fashion. We just had to find it. We've got enough to convict him of espionage and arrest him. Bam.
they caught Jim Nicholson mailing a postcard to the Russians. That's a communication saying, I'm ready for my next meet. It's a signal that he's doing something. But what really put the nails in that final coffin was prior to his trip, we witnessed Jim photographing classified documents to pass along to his Russian handlers. We were very confident that when he left on this next trip, he would have classified material on his person or his bags in some fashion. We just had to find it. We've got enough to convict him of espionage and arrest him. November 16, 1996, at Dulles International Airport, the FBI finally brought this matter to conclusion. The FBI placed themselves throughout the area in undercover positions surrounding the entire plane. We had agents positioned as bag handlers. There were FBI agents everywhere. He would go <laughs> dress up as bag handlers. They went hard in the paint, man. Through security, so you were sure that he had nothing on him that could be a weapon. He was also through security and committed himself to leaving the country to prove that he was en route to meet the Russians. They went up on the tarmac there at Dulles and let Jim know that his life as a spy had now ended. His entire life collapsed around him in a five second. Yeah, that's an L right there for him. But wait, there's more, guys. The, the documentary gets crazier. Window where he realized at that moment, my life is over. The look on his face was the only honest look I saw on his face the whole time I knew the man. This arrest demonstrates that the counterintelligence reforms that have been put into place in the wake of Aldrich Ames have taken hold and that have led to our success in catching the spy Nicholson. In February 1997, Jim finally reached the plea deal with the prosecution. And he was there at the trial table as he read his statement. We locked eye contact briefly, and then he just turned away, but his face looked ashen when he turned away. And then he walked away, and that's the last time I've ever laid eyes on the guy. Jim Nicholson, he was mad as hell because that dude put him away. <laughs> And reached a plea agreement and was sentenced to 23 years. And at his request, he was transferred to a prison in Oregon so that he... Now, I know you guys are probably wondering, yo, why did he only get 23 years? The reason why, guys, <clears throat> is because he probably gave a whole bunch of cooperation and identified other people involved in this conspiracy uh, as well. So for him to get only 23 years for a crime like this tells me he provided a significant amount of information and he cooperated. I know for a fact that he took a polygraph. He had been debriefed several times etc so that's the only reason why he got such a light sentence for such a serious crime in contrast to robert hansen who's doing life in prison right now for a very similar charge to be close to his children and his family why was he spying for the russians what was he getting from it i think uh, yeah, it's a good question but i don't know uh, he claims he needed the money uh but i think that's just an excuse i think he viewed himself as a master spy and could operate with impunity in our face. It's like uh, pursuing adventure. All right, both those guys are wrong. The real reason, guys, is because he made about $300,000 during his whole 10 years of spy. And the guy had a lot of debt. He was, uh, you know, needed to pay off a bunch of his credit card debt, American Express, et cetera. And we're going to go through some of those documents after this documentary. But the biggest reason was money. He had gotten kind of hit with a divorce pretty hard back in 94. So he was in a very susceptible position to be turned by, uh, you know, foreign government sure uh, all the time in the foreign service uh, wherever you go you'll find something interesting to do he asked for it he chose poorly and he paid for it and he'll pay for it till he draws his last breath in the summer of 2007 i got called down to the special agent in charge's office out of the blue and asked if I was interested in working on a very important here we go part two of it guys it gets better oh shit oh shit important case it would ultimately be very high profile and so of course the next logical question from my perspective was well what is it and the answer was you've got to so this guy guys is a regular special agent from the FBI so uh, he's retired now but when you're the regular, like you're, when you're just the title of special agent, you're the one that actually carries cases, which would make sense that they want to bring him to actually be the investigator and lead case agent in the situation versus the supervisor overseeing it. Like the other two guys that we saw in the documentary. Say yes before we'll tell you what it is that you're going to be working on. 
I was called into my supervisor's office in Eugene, Oregon, and uh, he told me that this sensitive case had come up and he said he wanted me to close her. This guy right here more than likely was, because he's also an FBI special agent, and you guys can see from the title, he was more than likely the co-case agent on this with that other guy that we saw. Uh, when you got big cases like this, guys, you typically need two to three agents. It's a case agent's running the case, and a case agent is the person that's responsible for getting the reports ready, bringing it, and making it, um, preparing the case for prosecution and trial. Get they you say everything they need, debrief informants, interview suspects, etc. So something of this magnitude more than likely would need two guys. Reassign every case that I had. Which you're about to see what's about to pop off in a second, guys. Which was very unusual. And considering I had some significant uh, cases going at the time and terrorism cases. So I drove the 110 miles up to Portland and, and got briefed. We learned that Jim Nicholson's son, Nathan Nicholson, was suspected of working with his father and making contact with the Russians. I was familiar with James Nicholson's case, you know, him being the highest ranking CIA officer ever convicted of espionage. But Nathan, I knew nothing about Nathan. I mean, he was, he was 12 years old when his dad went to jail in 96. At that point, we needed additional information to solidly make the criminal case. Well, even though Jim was in prison, he was very high up in the ranks and, and he knew quite a bit about the inner workings of uh, the agency. You never know for sure what information that he could still be giving them. We needed to find out what it was that was being provided by Jim Nicholson to the Russians. So we went back and looked at the telephone calls that he had made to try to glean information that might be useful for the case. You have a prepaid call from... This is Dad Car Daddy. An inmate at a federal... Hey, hey, Bob. Hey, Nate. I thought I'd call you and see what kind of hours you're keeping these days. Oh, uh, pretty, pretty much the same, I guess. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, I'm on the road heading back now. Oh, are you? Okay, okay. Did everything go okay? Yeah, everything went uh, real well. I got a, uh, uh, sale for about, uh, five, five K. Oh, so business is picking up, huh? Yeah, yeah, sure is. Oh, excellent, excellent. I mean, there were some odd phone calls of him making a sale for 5K, and Nathan was barely treading water. You know, I think he made, you know... That's a clue right there. About $9,000 in a year from, from Pizza Hut. He lived in a small apartment over in uh, Springfield, Oregon. Our job was now to start peeling the onion about Nathan and finding out what he might be doing for his father that involved Russian intelligence. Nathan had been going to visit Jim since he was 12 years old, and he idolized his dad from those contacts. He seemed to be a very dutiful son, you know, really cared about his family, his siblings, his religious convictions. He seemed like a, a pretty nice person that had been trying to make his own way since he was probably about 12 years old, you know, when things weren't working out for him. He tried to go to school, then he tried the army, and then he got injured, and, you know, his life had been a series of setbacks. I think... Nathan was vulnerable at that point to... And 5000 back then, guys, was worth about $7,000 today. Looking for some direction and... Uh, or 7300 roughly, purchasing power. Uh, Dad had a plan in mind. I do know that he used scripture to... My man still wanted to keep spying. <laughs> L Dad. Try to influence and manipulate his boy uh, in a way that in my view, was not positive. Hey, I got a verse for you. It's uh, Isaiah 45, 3. Isaiah 45, 3. Yep. It's really going to be a good one. <laughs> I got my Bible here. And I will give you treasures hidden in the darkness, secret riches. I will do this so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, the one who calls you by name. Yep. Wow. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. I claimed it for you and me. <laughs> <laughs> Self snitching. Yo, L Dad in the chat, guys. L Dad in the chat. <laughs> Did he forget that these goddamn, uh, you know, jail calls are recorded? Absolutely. You know, basically was telling Nathan he was a loyal, loyal soldier and, uh, you know, we're doing God's work. It's uh, appalling. You know, I mean, again, I don't think Jim would make a father of the year, you know, <laughs> far from it. 
we were eager to start monitoring Nathan's telephone calls, his travel in his car, all the kinds of ways that he might communicate with the Russians to find out what was it that he could be giving them that might be of value. We were able to monitor his computer use and uh, we were able to get a GPS in his car. The GPS was put on the 5th of December, which was a Friday. And back then, guys, if I'm not mistaken, they didn't need a warrant to put a GPS or a tracker on your car. I'm going to actually look this up. And it was the FBI that fucked this one up. Now, if the feds want to put a tracker in your car, you need a search warrant. This case actually might be the reason why it got messed up. Let me, I'm going to look it up for y'all real fast. But let's keep going. But it was not until the following Monday when they went to test the GPS for the first time. Uh, it worked perfectly, but the problem was the car was at Portland International Airport. It was a surprise, not a, not a pleasant surprise. We found out he had flown out of Portland International to Lima, Peru. So immediately we assumed that he was going to Peru to uh, meet with the Russians. We figured out what his itinerary was in terms of when he would be returning. The decision was made to intercept him when he came back into the country. And to intercept him when he comes back in the country, you got to go through uh, customs. And they do that. Him son, Nathan, had flown out of Portland International to Lima, Peru. So immediately, we okay. Here's the case that I was talking about, guys. I'll show you real fast. It's this one right here, J United States versus Jones, 2012, uh, ruling that installing GPS tracking device on a vehicle and using the device to monitor the vehicle's movements it constitutes a search under the Fourth Amendment. So basically, guys, um, prior to 2012, you'd be able to just throw a tracker on any car, no need for a warrant, etc. And I remember when I was an intern back in 2010. They were even at Homeland Security, they were doing that all day. But it was when the FBI did it and kind of got jammed up with Jones that this Supreme Court filing was uh, was filed where it constitutes as a search and you can no longer just throw a GPS on a car. So uh, so this is prior to that. So these guys were just probably putting more trackers on every one of these dude's cars. <laughs> and even more so because it's a national security case. He uh, assumed that he was going to Peru to uh, meet with the Russians. And a decision was made to intercept him when he came back into the country. When he came through customs in Houston, we were waiting for him. We had FBI agents down there. They, in concert with customs and border protection, pulled Nathan aside for secondary inspection. They were able to separate him from him. And this is where an HSI agent would come in to help the FBI. I can't tell you how many times, you know, the FBI needs assistance at the airport, whatever. They don't own the ports. Uh, HSI does and CBP officers can help, but it's got to be HSI running the situation when the FBI shows up at the airport because HSI are actually special agents and investigators as well. So CBP can't do anything without the HSI being there. So I know for a fact that when this guy came back into the country, they had to have had an HSI agent there present to facilitate this dump or whatever you guys are about to see here going on because the FBI, contrary to popular belief, does not have customs authority like an HSI does or CBP which allows you to search someone when they come back into the country without a warrant, which is a very powerful tool that only HSI agents have when it comes to special agents. Obviously, CBP officers have it as well, but they're not investigators, so it's got to be HSI to do it. His backpack, and we were able to search that. So while customs agents were interviewing Nathan about the purpose of it, think, think, uh, think of CBP, a.k.a. Customs and Border Protection. Think of them as the police department. And HSI is the detectives, right? D DHS is one big police department. HSI are the detectives uh, in, in that department. And CBP and Border Patrol are the, considered the uniform officers. This trip, FBI agents were copying all the paperwork that Nathan had brought back with him. And during that search, we found... And the reason why they had customs officials interviewing him was so that it could look like a routine interview. Hey, what's, you know, where, what's your... This, a reason for traveling, etc., kind of keep them calm while the bureau agents, along probably an HSI agent, help them search his stuff and get them whatever they need. Because um, HSI can also search your phone at the border as well, which is a powerful authority that FBI can't do either. So being able to search someone's phone at the border is even bigger. Uh, a number of very incriminating items that really broke the case wide open. They found some money that he brought back. I think it was over seven or eight thousand dollars on him. 
And they found a notebook that had a lot of, and that's a very common tactic, guys, with criminals where they'll come in with under 10,000 so they don't have to report it to customs, which, you know, takes the spot, keeps them out of the spotlight. And because whenever you come in with 10,000 or more, you know, or for that matter of fact, you do any transaction in the United States that's over 10,000 or more, you have to file something called a currency transaction report, which is filed with the IRS. Very interesting information in it. The notebook was pretty much the jackpot. It confirmed he had addresses of the Russian embassy in Mexico City. He had the address for the Russian embassy in Lima, Peru. The Russians were always very interested in trying to find out how Jim Nicholson got caught first go around. Just like any spy agency, they're concerned with moles in their midst. The notebook confirmed that Jim used his son, Nathan, as a courier. You know, the courier messages from Jim in prison and then courier questions back from the Russians through Nathan back to him in prison, for which they received compensation. And in the notebook, we found information about this Mexican Yahoo account with a password in it. And they were to use code words in their communication. His father would be Eugene. He was Dick and the Russians were Nancy. This little notebook had a treasure trove of information in it that then allowed us to pretty much predict what was going to happen from that point forward. I think Nathan wanted to do such a good job and make sure he didn't make any mistakes and forget anything that he, he kept detailed notes. Nathan was not a very good spy. <laughs> For obvious reasons, he didn't train like his dad. After this all happened, they let him go on his way and went home. We had discussions back at headquarters as to where we wanted to go with this case. The evidence we got from the custom search in Houston was very suspicious, but in and of itself, you know, it was still circumstantial. So a decision was made at that point that we were going to let this play out because we needed to develop additional information to solidly make. Translation, the AUSA said, I need more. Go back to the drawing board, guys. I'm not indicting this thing until I feel that we're going to win this thing in trial. And this is one of the biggest differences between the feds and the state. The feds, the AUSA uh, assistant United States attorney or assistant United States attorney isn't going to prosecute a case unless they feel like they have like a 100% chance of winning. This is why feds don't lose. They typically have the case ready to go to trial by the time the case is indicted. Okay, so you guys, let me let me break that down real, real quick. When you indict someone, you formally charge them. At that point, you're still gathering evidence. It is what it is. AUSAs aren't even going to indict until they're ready for trial. Whereas you go to the state system with ADAs, assistant district attorneys, they'll go ahead and charge you on anything and try to figure out the trial later. And you guys can see a perfect example of this with the Tory Lane's case, where they're trying to introduce evidence, you know, after the fact or whatever. Feds don't make rookie mistakes like that because they have the privilege of not having to worry about taking every single case. So any case that does come to them, typically it's going to be serious, typically it's going to be higher profile, and they're going to have that thing ready to go to trial by the time it's indicted. That's the, one of the biggest differences between the feds and the state. Feds don't lose for a reason. The criminal case. In October 2008, Nathan logged on to the Yahoo Mexican account using the password and he'd left a message using the code names to confirm another meeting with the Russians for a December 10th meeting in Nicosia, Cyprus. It was like, um, hola, Nancy, it's good to hear from you. My brother Eugene as well. The Russians were Nancy, Nathan was Dick, and Jim was Eugene. The meeting for Cyprus was on. Prior to his trip to Cyprus, Nathan received a letter from his father, which, when I saw it, immediately jumped out at me as something that could not have been designed for Nathan's viewing, but had to have been for the Russians. It was all sorts of information about Jim and his children. All right, let's, for the Russian, from let's, his father. Let's go ahead and read this letter out loud, guys. Father which when I saw it, immediately jumped out at me. All right, so it, go, it reads, Dear, um, no, sorry guys, hold on. Dear, uh, dear son, hi Tiger, I want to thank you for your very moving letter to, of 10 August. I want to also tell you that the qualities you said you had received from me 
Respect for others, discipline, endurance, faith, patience, love, and sheer willpower are very much qualities that apply to you, whether you receive them via me or uh, I don't know what that end means. I am so very proud of you, son. You are a man of great courage and blessings to our entire family. Next, I want to tell you my physical exam, how my physical exam went this month in general. I am in excellent physical condition. Here are some statistics. Puts his weight, high eye color, uh, eye color corrected to 2020 or eye vision power. And then he puts his date of birth. Blood pressure 127 over 67, taken August 20th, 2008. And notice how he has it written day, month, year. That's a big catch because guys, only in the United States, we put the month, day, then year. Foreigners though, typically put 2808, which would be strange to write it that way to your son. Don't you think? Uh, and it goes, continuing on, my blood work came back looking good, no diseases, good cholesterol level 7, 8, August 2008. My EKJ exam also looked good, 20 August 08. I am not taking any medications and have a regular exercise regimen. I do take one, uh, let me get rid of these captions. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, I do take one aspirin a day. I have no allergies. I'm supposed to have redacted but it's turning slowly to silver this can be correct corrected later although the thinning will take a bit more work if i'm so inclined so even though it might look like a harmless letter at first there's codes all over this thing and i want you guys to pay attention to how he was persistent on writing everything out in number right so this is clearly a letter to his former handler giving them, him the current status of what's going on as something that could not have been designed for Nathan's viewing, but had to have been for the Russians. It was all sorts of information about Jim and his children. Jim goes into his eldest son's background, who was in the Air Force. Jeremy Nicholson, who was still in the military, he had a secret clearance. Jim was trying to throw a care. And that was just one page of the letter, guys. So I'm sure it was probably longer, which is why we didn't see that stuff uh, in that little picture we saw. Or to the Russians, like, hey, I have this other son. Maybe down the road, this will be of some value. I looked at Jim's letters. I go, Jim, you, you SOB. You SOB to hear you did this to Nathan, and now you're putting this out there. I mean, you could be actually putting your oldest son and family in jeopardy. Nathan traveled. To he didn't learn his lesson. Cyprus in December of 2008 for the purpose of meeting with the Russians while there. He was supposed to meet them at a TGI Fridays on the evening of Wednesday, December the 8th. The Russians met him at that location and he was ultimately paid $12,000 and he provided the Russians with the letter that had been given to him by Jim that had all the information about Jim and his children. We knew we had enough evidence to charge the father, charge the son. It was time to bring it to a close. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the PA was his code name that he used with his Russian handler versus using his real initials. So that was also kind of a giveaway. After Nathan came back from Cyprus, we knew we had enough evidence to charge the father, charge the son. It was time to bring it to a close. And so when he came back from Cyprus, Nathan was interviewed on the 15th of December in 2008. That was right when he came back, when he was tired, when he was suffering from jet lag. You know, it was a good time to catch him off guard, uh, get him out of his comfort zone. But he started off just lying, and he lied for the first hour of the interview about what he was doing in Cyprus and uh, why he went. They stopped him at one point and said, look, it will give That's This is very typical, guys. You rarely get a confession right up front. Typically, the first hour is building rapport, letting them lie, catching them in lies here and there. And, uh, you know, people think it's easy to interview suspects. It's not. You a, a do-over. We'll give you a mulligan. We'll give you a chance to set this right. You know, you say lying to the FBI is a crime. We know quite a bit about your travel. I think he really wanted to get this off his chest. And for the next hour or two, he pretty much confessed everything and gave a written confession. Whoop. Gotcha! 
gotcha, bitch. Well, this is why you don't talk to the police, guys. <laughs> but they probably had so much overwhelming evidence. He was just like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. And obviously, he's a kid. He doesn't know any better. He's just following his dad's order. So, hell for him. But he didn't actually get arrested until a couple of weeks later. We wanted to see what he might say post-interview while we still had electronic coverage of him. You know, his conversation with other people showing guilty knowledge. Guilt. So this is actually really smart that they're doing this because what that allows them to do is when they listen to the phone calls, this is what you call tickling the wire. And what this basically entails is anytime you take like an investigative step in your investigation where like there's some kind of law, overt law enforcement presence, a lot of times phone calls are going to be made right after or, you know, a day or two after, maybe minutes after where they talk about their experience to someone that they trust. And if you have the right phones tapped, right, you can go ahead and listen to it, which will give you even more evidence to show that they're culpable. So this was actually very smart that they kind of let him stew for a bit and monitor the phones, monitor the pen registers, monitor the, the phone logs and go from there and see if they can identify other potential conspirators. Intent. And um, one of the conversations we overheard is after he was interviewed by the FBI was with his sister, Star. Nathan, are you okay? Yeah. Oh, hold on, guys. No, that is not what I want. I don't know why I did that. Sorry, guys. Let's go back to it right here. And there's a bunch of good episode, a bunch of good um, stuff on this uh, show, guys. So yeah, I'm okay. We're going to be covering a bunch of it, so don't worry. Hey, are you okay? I'm good. What's up with the FBI? Well, it's a uh, kind of a, a long story, to be honest with you. You know, the FBI interviewed everybody. Yeah, I, I know. I know. <laughs> Bro. FBI, open up! But what was going on is I was uh, uh, transporting some information. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, getting paid for it. Okay. Holy! Bro. <laughs> Talk about incriminating. This is the L all the way. You stupid. <laughs> if I'm the case agent listening to this phone call, I'm like, yo, this is gold. This is awesome. Uh, yeah. And on top of that, this is going to implicate his father. Remember, guys, they're going to probably try to, they're going to go after his dad with this too. Okay. And that's what the whole deal was about. Who the information was it for? Uh... Well, it, it was it was for uh, the Russians. Oh! <laughs> and his sister, her reaction is hilarious. Dude, seriously, it just sounds kind of like what Daddy did. Yeah, it was. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, God. <sighs> exactly what Daddy did, and he acknowledged that he'd sort of been living a lie for the last year and a half. I went out to talk to Jim Nicholson in the prison on December the 15th. I showed him a postcard that had written on it, Welcome to Cyprus. And I explained to him at that point that we knew what had been going on. And he said, well, it sounds like what you're trying to do is uh, put Nathan in jail. So before I uh, say anything, I, I think I'm going to need to talk to an attorney. <laughs> See how much smarter the dad is versus the son? As a parent myself, I would have thought he'd been ready to do most anything to try to get Nathan out of the jam, but he didn't help his son. In January, Nathan. Well, let's be honest. Like you, in that type of situation, you're not going to get less time for your son if you cooperate. You typically want to go with a lawyer, talk, get that lawyer involved, then come back to the government and try to negotiate. So, you know, I got to play devil's advocate here. He was actually smarter to not say anything contact his attorney, then try to negotiate through the attorney versus trying to, you know, make a deal with the agent. Because to be honest with y'all, agents can't really do nothing. And this is coming from a former agent. I got to do everything through the prosecutor's office. Like, you know, that's why you're instructed, you know, when you're taught in the academy of interviewing suspects, you're told to never promise them anything. And the only thing you can say is, I'm going to talk to your attorney all about it because they're the ones that make the final decisions. So, <clears throat> so this is typically what would end up going in a situation like this, but um, smart on him to not talk. Don't fall for it, guys. He was arrested and eventually released on bail, but he, I think he spent about 72 days in jail. Jim gave him the idea that he had not done anything wrong right from get-go. And so being held in jail, it kind of helped him uh, to the conclusion that maybe his dad hadn't been as good a friend as he always led him 
himself out to be. I... Damn, Eldad. Oh, the Oregonian. I had myself believe that I wasn't doing anything wrong. You know, here's my hero. He was trying to help me out. And I still wrestle with the idea that he may or may not have manipulated me. Nathan received five years probation from the judge and Jim got an additional eight year sentence and was ultimately sent to Supermax in Florence, Colorado. And that's the worst one. That's where all the worst terrorists are at, et cetera. So this guy, they gave him a chance, put him in a better prison. He messes up, gets his son involved. Next thing you know, he's doing more time. His son ended up getting a slap on the wrist, uh, you know, probably because he cooperated and potentially because the father went ahead and said, hey, I'll cooperate. I'll give you, a, you know, I'll plead guilty to charge as long as you guys go lean in on my son. So more than, and that was probably set up through an attorney. So it was smart on him to not talk to the FBI agent at the time and negotiate something through counsel. Jim Nicholson basically said it was just a way to help out the family, but I don't think so. I think he's just full of himself. I mean, Jim fancied himself as being quite the spy master. But how good a spy could Jim have been? He's the only guy I know that ever got caught twice. Were you surprised that Jim had used his son to contact the Russians? Surprised? Not really. Further disappointed? Yeah. Somewhat shocked from the perspective of a father, that one father could do this to his son. But that's what desperate people do. Do you think he loved his kids? He loved his kids, but he loved himself more. He's an extreme narcissist. You know, I think you'd have to put it that way. For the father to do this to his family, I just can't, I can't believe it. What makes somebody do that? And then use his son to continue the operation? That's deplorable. His whole belief system has been destroyed by his father. I don't know how that kid deals with that. And I, as a parent, I don't know how any person can do that to their own child. He's forever labeled the son of his father that will trail him for the rest of his life. Yep, that definitely was an L, man. But yeah, guys, that's the documentary right there. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. Really interesting stuff. You know, that Russian espionage stuff is always fun. Uh, this is a, you know, copy of the uh, criminal complaint uh, for the arrest warrant or search warrant. And, you know, this is kind of an overview on it, but this is back from like 1995 or six. And it goes into all the facts of the case, which, you know, we talked about and Kind of had a bird's eye view with the documentary. But if you guys are interested in reading this, I can link this below. But here's some of the financial transactions I want to show you all that I mentioned earlier. You guys can see he was just getting paid a bunch of money, right? Where he was making all these payments that he couldn't necessarily explain legit, right? Paying off bills, credit unions, et cetera. So this actually, you know, piqued the uh, FBI's interest even more so when they're doing their investigation because all this money was unexplained. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if the affidavit has it here, but I think he made about 300000 when this was all said and done. I know that for a fact. I'm just trying to, trying to find it in the, in the thing. Because oh, here it says 100000 but later on they found out it was around three hundred k. Because this is when they first arrested him. So when he actually confessed and told them how much money he made, it was a lot more than this. So Because he did a couple of polygraphs, multiple debriefings, et cetera. But anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that one, man. Uh, I really enjoy this type of stuff. So let me get, know if you guys do comment below and uh, yeah, I'll catch you guys on the next episode of fed it like the video, subscribe and I'll catch y'all on Sunday. Peace. I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations. Okay guys, HSI. The cases that I did mostly were human smuggling,